This will be wild because this is not a good amp. Or is it? <laughs> Vsauce music playing. <laughs> Welcome to a new, I don't even know what that is, let's call it the series of videos I'd like to make to show you some nice gear, mods, and stuff I got laying around or are in use. Even if you like it or not, a whopping 39 people on YouTube voted yes to make this and well, fine, a couple of people voted to delete my channel, so if that doesn't work out, I might go with option 2. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you like it or not, a whopping 39 people on YouTube voted yes to make this. <laughs> Who wrote that fucking script? <laughs> So, what is this now? This is basically you now kind of gear reviews, but weird. I don't want to review gear I know for 16 hours and give you my humble and vague opinion about something that you might actually consider buying. Heck, I don't even want to decide for you if you should buy something or not, but I might want to influence your decision in not a subjective but an objective way so you can decide what's the better option for you. So why will those gear reviews will be weird? Will it be weird gear or is the review weird? The answer is yes. But see for yourself, or don't. If you made it this far, you might want to hear what I gotta say about the gear we discussed today. The Perfect Connection Lee Jackson GP1000. If you ever watched a video on this channel where I play guitar, you might have heard it already. I basically use it for every recording. I play these amps for many years now and our relationship is mixed, but there is probably a reason why I got four of them. But let's start from the beginning, shall we? Grab some drinks, some nice food and a cozy blanket because this will be boring. So you're probably not wondering who Lee Jackson actually is. Hi, welcome to my YouTube channel, I'm Lee Jackson. If you don't know who I am, I'm the owner and designer of Metaltronics and Lee Jackson amplifiers. But I'm gonna tell you anyway, way back in the days when amps were still mostly analog, circuit boards were still handmade and an amp had to be as big as, well, an amp actually is and could only produce limited and certain sounds instead of being supercomputers that can be any amp you dream of, there were actual people building and modding amps. Lee Jackson is one of them. He started to create signature sounds for a lot of big people people in the old music industry, where having a distinct and unique guitar sound was actually something desirable, to sound new or to sound, well, like only you. One of them was Zach Wilde for No Rest for the Wicked by Ozzy Osbourne, yes, you hear Lee Jackson amps on there, specifically the GP1000. <laughs>
Bactuli. He was born in Southern Carolina and his parents owned a record store, so he was always surrounded by music even at a young age. His father was into electronics and were repairing TVs and home electronics in his local repair shop. I guess you know where this is going. Lee got his first amp, a Tesco Del Rey amp, and took it apart. Guess what? To get more power out of it. He records some albums, toured live, and owned companies like Metaltronics, Perfect Connection, and Lee Jackson Designs. Also worked and designed for companies like Ampac, Fender, Crate, BC Ridge, Paul Rivera, just to name a few. So that guy knows what he's doing. We talk about the perfect connection part of him. That company lasted from 1985 to 92 and only produced a handful of products. The first one was an active stereo splitter and to be fair I don't know how many were made. Can't be that much since it's very hard to find any information about those in general. Then there were two different versions of the GP1000. Well it's actually three slash four or more but more to that later. Then there was the BP-1000, which is the base equivalent of the GP-1000 and the SP-1000, which was a solid state power amp. Power amp? Oh yeah, the GP-1000 is a preamp. Uh, glad that you asked what actually a preamp and a power amp is and why does it even matter, because it will make this review way too long and boring. I warned you. A preamp basically boosts a weaker level to a line level, and a power amp boosts the line level so you can actually damage your ears with that signal through your way too loud 4x12 in your living room. Awesome. <laughs> Who wrote that shit? Usually, if you buy an amp, those two are already combined. So a Marshall hand and equivalents contain already a preamp and a power amp section. Both are always needed, because a power amp needs a line level and your preamp is just too weak to boost the low guitar level to actually give you high pitch noises in your ears after a concert that will fade two days after you recovered from your temporal hear loss down to the road to Beethoven ears. And this is what the Lee Jackson GP1000 is, a preamp. For that, you need a power amp and oh. God, you got so many to choose, but we'll come to that later. So the Lee Jackson is a 19 inch rack preamp and man, it was the first mass produced rack preamp. It were roughly 10 to 15,000 made, combined of all two, uh, I say it's at least four versions, but those are only estimations by Lee Jackson himself. Also, he's still live creating sounds, content and more. For over 10 years though, he's promising to bring back the GP1000 as a reissue in pedal form. That never happened. But back to the history. Rack gear was just getting started and Bob Bradshaw was building all kinds of racks for professional players. They were looking for something that would go alongside with all the rack effects that were already available on the market. At this time, Lee Jackson was building and modding a lot of Fender Deluxes and Twins for a lot of the LA studio television crowd and session players. The only reasonable conclusion was to build a rack preamp following the desires players were having at the time coming to Lee Jackson. The most modded amp and every studio musician came to him to make him one. Heck, even the young Steve Vai was asking for one of this hot rotted Fender Deluxe reverb when he was still working on Flexible. That is where the first perfect connection Lee Jackson GP1000 was born. Basically a family member of the Deluxe. And it was only one rack space because Lee Jackson just put the 12AX7 laying on the side to save space. People were thinking that something horrible would happen with the tubes if you would put them on the side. He thought that that was actually bonkers. And then he just put them on the side. And guess what? It worked. And nobody wanted a preamp, amp or a fact that took two or three rack spaces because if you own a rack, you know that you always have too little space, no matter how big your rack is. The thing with those preamps though is that they were not consistently built. Those 15,000 probably have a lot of variations. Since Lee Jackson added and cut features and parts over time, whatever players were asking for at the time. So that's why, well, there are essentially two builds, but actually 
four, but probably more than a hundred different versions out there. But for now, let's stick with two. The first was a circuit leaning towards the Fender mod. The second was a Marshall mod. Did they have different names? No. Can you tell them apart? Yes-ish. Let's talk about the differences. The major difference is the sound. The Marshall mods sound a little bit hotter, they basically have more gain and are usually more desired by people on the market due to their higher gain. <laughs> <laughs> To the gain aspect, we will come a bit later when we actually discuss the sound. Other than that, you can differ them by the features they have on the back. The early GP1000 with beginning serial number 87 for, well, the year 87, had a DI out in the back, tube powered. Some had foot switches for the channel switch, some didn't. This is all though Fender mod. Then there's the transitioning model. Still 87 serial number, but the DI out vanished and it has a back plate to cover the holes. The GP1000 has three 12AX7 tubes, and the Fender Mod 2 were used for the actual amp, and the third for the direct out. To open up a new gain stage during the transitioning model, they cut the direct out and added the third tube to the gain stage. Then there's the so called True 88 model, which is, well, kinda misleading, because the Marshall Mod started already in the mid and late 87 models, which all had no DI out and differing wiring, capacitors and electronic arrangements. If I recall correctly, they even had different transformers. I might be wrong on that and I would have to check that up completely um, and find more pictures and videos of open GP1000s to confirm this, but I can't. They actually sound different though. But do they sound like a Marshall? <laughs> uh, no. Do they sound like a modded Marshall? No. But there are 88 models that have 87 serial numbers. You can't draw a straight line. To be really sure, you would need to open it up and look inside. All right, Lee Jackson with your serial number and he will tell you. And he actually does. But we will only check and talk about the desired 88 version. The Marshall mod that definitely doesn't sound like a Marshall, otherwise you wanted to buy a Marshall and didn't click on this freaking video. Uh, what was the point? Oh yeah, let's look at the features. You get a volume knob, which is your input volume, a gain distortion knob, which is a push-pull to switch channels, a treble push-pull knob, a mid-frequency knob, a six-way select mid-shift and a bass push-pull knob. And you get two master outs. One is bright and is piercing your ears with basically no low end and the other one has more low end and is a bit darker. And let me tell you, Half of the knobs do basically nothing. Let me explain before you listen to anything. Because we get a bit nerdy now. Let's look at the schematics of the GP1000. Somebody on the internet did a schematic of it. If it's completely and 100% accurate, I don't know and I didn't check everything because I never made a schematic myself or want to. But on the first glance it looks fine and that should be okay for this. Because the parts that we're talking about here are definitely true and are apparent in all perfect connection preamps. You see, on the upper left side, J1 and J2, which are the input jacks? One in the front and one on the back. Uh, after a bit of wiring you can see the first tube in use V one a pins 6, 8 and 7 to boost your input volume. After that you can see the equalizer. So you see the mid shift, treble, bass, middle and all the push pulls. After that you see that under P1 there is again something with volume. That's basically your input volume knob. Weird. Oh yeah, the equalizer is some kind of affect your input volume too. So turn everything on 20 and your input signal actually gets louder. Thank you. 
What a weird feature. But it later serves a purpose and it's absolutely weird. But let's continue for a bit. V1B is again first two but different pins, two, three, and one. Now we come to the distortion pull. Wait, one. Is what you might be thinking about this schematic. If you're a bit familiar with the fag pedals and or schematics of amps, especially for amps with distortion, then you might have noticed by now that something is weird and the order is a bit wrong. And this schematic must be mistaken. And let me tell you, it's not. For all of you out there who have no idea what I'm talking about, I'll explain this to you real quick. Now, to confuse you even more, I'll show you a schematic of another tube amp I have laying around the Ibanez Thermion TN120. This would be probably called a traditional build of a tube amp, but we are now only interested in the preamp section of that amp, which is basically what the GP1000 is. Next to some other input features nobody needed in the 80s, you see the input jack. From there, likewise, the GP1000, we use one of the tubes to boost our input signal. From there we take the input and go straight to the next stage, which is a channel select to select between clean, high gain, crunch, vintage, distortions and all the channels and variations and features you got. From there we go straight into the preamp tube section and already here the GP1000 is different because before you even go into the selection of channels, which the Lee Jackson got two of, clean and distortion, we're already EQing the signal before the channel select. The Ibanez here, which is basically a meso circuit, goes from the channel select into the gain stages, so to speak easy, where your signal gets the chug chug you all off. So a distorted sound. With the many different other features connected we're not interested in now, the signal goes from there into the EQ stage. And that's where the huge difference is at. Usually amps are built that you EQ after the gain stage to make actual use of the EQ. The Lee Jackson preamp goes from the EQ to the gain stage, so it's flipped to other usual amplifiers. Old Fender amps do have the same circuit, so EQ before gain, but back then nobody needed much gain anyway. If you have still no idea what I'm talking about, I'm gonna explain it to you in easy terms. If you EQ before a gain stage, then your EQ is as minimal as it can get. That's why I said half of the knobs basically do nothing.
What usually turning a knob from 1 to 3 on the Ibanez Amp EQ would be, would be on the Lee Jackson from 1 to 20 and push or pull and then turn again from 1 to 20. Your EQ on this preamp is as minimal as it can get. So the, your room to change the EQ and react to deal with other gear in your signal chain is minimal to non-existent. But let's go back to the schematics of the GP1000. So after all your EQ, we finally go to the gain stage. There's not much going on though, other than now getting that absolute monster gain going. <sighs> section of the preamp before it leaves finally to the power amp you get two masters with different resistors and capacitors using different pins of the last tube one of the master outputs is absolutely not usable due to basically no low end and let me tell you this preamp comes with basically very little low end <laughs> And that is the whole preamp in schematics. So to speak, the only real impact in terms of EQ that you can achieve is the mid-shift. Every other knob there is does little to no changes.
midshift is for your information, something Lee Jackson picked up from Paul Rivera. But do we need the big EQ changes anyway? Yes and no. Lee Jackson himself was recommending the use of an Apex Oral Exciter to give the preamp more bottom end, and they were the reason Zach Wilde had that big bottom end with those, so there must be something to it, right? The more low end would be nice, but in my opinion, you don't really need it. Playing that thing live means your low end will vanish anyway, crossing bass and low drum frequencies. So it's actually more of a use to be in a very mid-range frequency to stand out of the other instruments in bands. So no, I don't think you really need it, unless you have gear that is not compatible with this preamp. And boy. This piece of shit is picky. As you can tell, I'm not the kind of guy that plays with low gain, but well, for today's standard, my sound is actually low gain. But what actually comes out of the preamp in terms of gain is more of a low crunch sound of your amp you're probably using right now. This preamp does not sound like you want it to sound for several months, and it shows. People are usually underwhelmed by what they've bought. The gain, even for the 88 Marshall mod, which had different components and another tube for the gain stage, is not a lot. Usually, everybody will crank input volume to max and the distortion to max, and it will still be not enough. If you crank up your EQ, though, you will even then get a gain boost, since they don't really do anything anyway. Why not crank them up a bit more to get another 2% of gain? But still, it won't be enough. And then there's the factor that those preamps are from the late 80s, so they tend to be a bit noisy. The more you max out, the noisier it gets. So that's why I usually recommend to have a noise gate or two laying around for that thing. <laughs> What do I mean with this amp is picky? Let's talk real now. Anybody who says that the Lee Jackson is the best sounding gear since day one, they're lying. It sounds like shit. You will hate it for several months until you eventually get a usable sound out of it. Why? This thing is picky about every component you have. Guitars, pickups, pickup heights, gain boosts, EQs in front, EQs in the effects loop, the power amp, the effects, the speakers in your cabinet, the cabinet itself, it, it's not even funny, and it's a hassle. Since you don't have much options to sculpture the sound with the amp, because the EQ is non-existent, the gain itself is as low as you can imagine gain was in the 80s. Even though it was a lot about that time, you don't have room to tweak the knobs on that amp. 5 out of 6 midshifts are unusable with the wrong setup, sometimes even 6 out of 6. The same goes for other EQs, you just can't get the right sound you want with it unless you change your gear around it. And that's where the problem begins if you're not willing to change your gear for the amp. Even Lee Jackson stated that the EQ controls are a blessing and occurs at the same time. In one interview, he was asked, since there were a lot of complaints about the EQ and push-pull knobs that basically didn't do anything, they wanted to know if there was a way to mod the preamp so they actually have a significant effect. His short answer was no. 
there's none. In his years of designing, he found out that placing an EQ differently in a preamp actually has a drastic effect on how it will work and changes the overall sound of the preamp, or full amplifier. And as we know now, he put the EQ in front of the gain stage and they shape the sound before they get distorted, like old Fender amps did. The problem is that once the preamp is set into saturation, like distortion does, the EQ effect comes less and less. Since most people crank everything up when it comes to the input volume and distortion, the saturation is fully maxed out for the preamp, hence the EQ does nothing. In his own words, changing the position of the EQ would hurt the magic of the GP1000. And to be fair, I guess he's absolutely right. The GP1000 got tone-wise something magical that no preamp did. The mids and overall sound of this preamp is unique and great, if you actually manage to set it up properly. And that's what makes it a horrible amp. It is not flexible at all. <laughs> of this made the GP1000 actually to a very great sounding amp. I know you've been waiting for this. It's Alexia and Rope from Children of Bodom, and let's now talk about them. They use those amps in metal, something that this piece of gear is absolutely not intended for, but they made it work. Unlike Zach Wilde, who used it a bit differently, they really tried to get the maximum out of that preamp with basically keeping the original and unique sound of it. Both of them, Alexia and Rope, used preamps in the guitars, respectively. The Jackson GE-1000 and or the ESP MM04, which is basically a copy of that Jackson preamp to boost a very low output pickup with a preamp hotter than any active pickup can get. The charm lies within the vintage sound of the pickup in combination with a very powerful preamp. To top it all off, the preamp has a 3-band EQ inside, which is not even correct. It is more of a frequency response change of the pickup, but that's a story for another time. Rupi even said that the GP1000 is an 80s product with its one sound, angry sounding little tube amp. It's horrible as that, but if you add the active electronics and gain boost from your guitar, the result is just great. Needs a little bit of EQ though. And he's right, this combination actually works really well, and it adds something to that preamp that is missing. But don't get fooled here, if you think that is everything you need to get the bottom sound or hell get this preamp to sound good. You're wrong. Alexia and Rope got mods done to their preamps. They added more gain and more low end to their amps. So that's already one part you need to keep in mind. 
If you need this, this is absolutely up to you and to your taste and sound. But keep in mind, there are so many other different variables in that chain. First, you need to know that you should never go by presets and settings when it comes to amps. The acoustics in rooms vary and are a factor of how your amp sounds too. If you play a lot of live shows in very different locations, you know what I mean by that. So always use your ears and try to find a sound that you like. Doesn't matter if it comes out of a Line 6 Spider, a GP1000 or a plug-in. So for the first time, let's talk about the power amps. I tried a couple power amps with that preamp and god, this fucking shit piece of metal is picky. At some point I stuck with the PV5050 Classic. You have a presence and a resonance control which suits the preamp very well. Hence the little control you got over the preamp it is really nice to have something in addition to shape a bit the sound. Also you can bridge that power amp to get a maximum saturation of the tubes and power out of that thing which is really handy. Also I really enjoy the saturation of this amp and overall sound. I tried the infamous Rocktron Velocity and I didn't like it and I know some of you guys are thinking about buying it because Alexi supposedly used it at some point. For the price it's fine, it was too dull and something was missing. The SP1000 from Lee Jackson is similar. It sounds nice and actually this power amp boosts your distortion again by 10 to 20 percent which is huge and was huge at the time since power amps in that time distorted around 0.002%. It sounds fitting and it is a small power amp which fits with one U in every rack but still something is missing. I mean you can listen to yourself. <laughs> use this preamp because it's actually fine and small as a backup power amp in my rack. So if my PV fails on stage, I can quickly switch to this. I've never tried the VHT power amps. I might at some point, but I'm really happy with my setup now and I don't think I have a reason to change that anytime soon. But many people like those power amps, probably one because they sound good, be they are expensive, so they have 
have to be good and see Alexi used it. And I guess some people like to use those with the preamp due to the fact that Alexi and Rope actually used them for a very long time. Then again, I can't stress this enough. Use your ears. Try test, change, and stick with what you like. When it comes to power amps, you really have to check if you like the setup. And don't give up, you just haven't tried enough power amps then. And keep in mind for tube power amps that the saturation of the tubes might play a big role to your sound. So if you always keep them at a level where you can play and not annoy your neighbors, then you might not get the sound that you actually desire because your tubes are not saturated enough. Let's talk about the signal chain that I'm using. So you get a glimpse of it, what I do to make all of this work and get the maximum out of it. Right now I'm plugging my guitar right into the board. When I'm live, I'm using a wireless transmitter, which basically is in the rack, and then the signal goes from the rack into the paddle board. And that's where I plug my guitar right now, so I bypass the wireless transmitter. From there, I can go with my signal through either six of the loops that I set up, or I can bypass it completely and can send my signal dry as it is into the rack. So what my board is actually doing there to switch the channels, I don't switch channels, I switch preamps. So I got three dedicated outputs on my board to switch my signal into one of those preamps. One for clean, one for rhythm distortion, and one for solos. But to keep it a bit simple, I will not explain you now the whole rack. If you are interested in what I actually did inside the rack, then leave a comment and I might explain it at some point. So from there I change the outputs to select one of the inputs of the preamps. From the preamps, the signal basically goes into a mixing station. I'm using the Behringer X32 rack because it's compact and I can use it off of my phone or just use the buttons that are in front, which some of the mixing stations that are supposed to be in a rack are not able to and you can only use them off of the phone. But I I like to have buttons on my thing so I can actually use it if my phone dies. So from there, I'm basically not mixing the signal, but only changing the volumes. The thing is that from there it goes combined in one output from the rack into the power amp. I basically crank the power amp always the other way up to get a real saturation of the tubes. But what I can do now is I can basically change the input volume from my mixer. So I always have saturated tubes. I can change the volume based on the mixing station so I don't have to touch any of my amps and I can change my volume from my phone or from the front of the Behringer. The thing is, and I had this a couple times at home and live, if you don't crank up the power amp high enough, it sounds like shit. Like, again, like this is another factor for that preamp and it's... And it's really annoying. So if you're in a venue which is really, really small and you can't crank everything up and the tech is like, can you put everything like real quiet? so I can mic it up and then basically only you have your amp for the stage sound and everything else comes out of the PA, um, then you already got a problem because it won't sound good. So what I came up with there is putting the mixer in between, crank everything up and then just adjust the volume over the mixer so all the tubes are actually always into saturation. I know this is not good for the tubes. It's not bad either, but they will run out faster due to the whole saturation and heat. But for the sake of the sound, I have to do it because otherwise I hate it. But from there, it goes from the power amp directly into a cabinet and here I'm using a Lee Jackson cabinet. This is made by Horizon and it's loaded with vintage 30s. It got basically four vintage 30s but um, two are original vintage 30s from the time they were produced and two are the vintage 30s slash signatures. Um, when I bought this, somebody swapped them out with a friend who had like the slash signature cabinet. Yeah, they just traded two speakers and I kind of have to say I like the sound. Uh, the other thing that I like to use is the Ibanez cabinet, which is also um, loaded with, with vintage 30s, but completely sounds different. It got way more low end, uh, probably due to 
the fact that this cabinet is massive. It is heavy. It has an additional strut inside. So there's basically another wall of wood between two speakers. Yeah, so that is basically the signal chain. Let's talk about one of the biggest factors when it comes to the preamp, the pickups in your guitar. And man, I've tried them all and always circling around a couple specific. But let me elaborate on this a bit. Let's go a bit further back in time and talk about times where I was not listening to sound, but listening to sound with my eyes. Over 10 years ago, I built this black gold and the white black RR models, the Alexi ish signatures that are a homage to those guitars of him. I started with the black one and the Alexi Lyo ALX set from EMG was just new on the market. So I opted for this and put them in there. At that point in time, I didn't have my sound yet that I liked. I was still searching for amps and pickups and all the stuff that I might like. And retrospective, I don't think I really liked the pickup. Well, the pickup was fine, the boost was horrible. Way too much gain, way too much everything. I couldn't get a sound out of them that I liked, but that shouldn't stop me from using them, right? Because they were cool and I bought them with money. My money. Of course, they had to be awesome then. <laughs> Then I built the wide one, and after that I ordered and put there a Jackson J50BC and an ESP MM04 because I wasn't really convinced of the ALX set. And well, this sounded better, but still I couldn't get any usable sound out of those for me. But I bought them, so they had to be good. <laughs> And sadly, this is a problem that many players face, and this is absolutely fine, but at some point you should grow out of that. But that's a story for a different time, again. I bought different amps and I was never satisfied. But then I gathered all my will and I bought the first Lee Jackson preamp. With no intention of actually getting a decent sound or using it, rather than I just want to have it for nostalgic reasons and aesthetics. Because they look cool and there were so many legends about it. So I've tried a couple pickups and guitars with that preamp. Let me name a few. EMG 81, 81X, 85, 60, the ALX set, the HZ H4, HZ H3, HZ H1, HZ H2, Seymour Duncan Blackouts, SH13, Dimebucker, TB6, some Ibanez pickups, I believe they were like N7, N8. I've tried a lot, even single coils, but no, I could not get a usable sound out of any of them. Even the ALX sounded terrible. And then I tried the J50BC with an ESP MM04 and 
it sounded terrible but i like the sound only there was a lot missing but the bass sound of it the mid slicing and sharp mid sound that was great and i never heard something like this I started to improve weeks after weeks, tweaking first the gain from the boost, then switching every other day the settings of the EQ in the guitar, and well, the EQ on the amp, playing around with settings of the power amp, change power amps, and when I was finally at some point where it was fine-ish with the sound, I plugged in a different guitar with different pickups, and I hated it. So I took the Black V and plugged it in, J50BC and EMG, ALX is not that different, is it? <laughs> it sounded like shit. So I had to do the same with a preamp too, pick up heights, tweaked all the dip switches, and then try it again. I couldn't find a better solution for different pickups though. They weren't hot enough, the sound was not fitting, only those very low output pickups seemed to fit with a boost. <laughs>
So I started to throw all the different pickups I gathered over the years out of my guitars and slowly changed to the boost systems. And well, I was happy then, but I also tried the PA2 boost with those pickups and I still got one laying around somewhere, but it lacks the EQ or should I probably say the frequency response of the MMO4 ABQ or JE1000. You can counter that though with a good EQ in front of the preamp, but well, it's a hassle since you actually need to have, again, different setting for different guitars, which is making it a bit annoying. Also, changing the frequency response of the pickup does a little bit different changes to the sound than an EQ would do in front of the preamp. Right now, I'm very happy with either combinations, Jackson J50BC and MMO4 or JE1000, but I use also the LLX set from EMG. Though something is different, they are similar, but something is different. I got the feeling they are more muddy than the H2. Might just be a feeling though. I would have to A-B test it. I still like them, prefer the H2 or J50BC though. It might though have to do with the ABQ boost and rather less with the pickup itself. Uh, because when you look at the technical sheets of the the H2 and the ALX pickup, they seem to be identical. But probably only EMG really knows if there is any change to that pickup. The pickup is not the only thing that is very crucial to the setting, because I already told you that basically everything in your signal chain matters. I made that horrible mistake too. The cabinet. I got a lot of cabinets, some in a rehearsal room, some at home, and boy, this preamp hates everything in your chain. Wrong cab, wrong speakers, sound like shit, tweak everything again. Same for guitars, pickups, effects, and so on. So you basically have to set up everything up for exactly one signal chain, and if you happen to change anything, you might have a very bad day then. This does not make a good amp, since it is not versatile. It is definitely not. And anyone who will tell you different lies. It can only produce one sound, and that's it. And this sound it does, it does phenomenal. But that's about it. There's nothing more. A lot of people compliment my sound when I play live, not knowing what I'm actually playing, even from people who are really knowing what they are talking about, and not your usual drunk mid-40 midlife crisis dancer who loves every pop-punk song you play that evening. Sound-wise, this amp is horrible and great. Don't expect it will produce a sound you like. It has no low end to little, and you probably don't start with gear around it that suits this preamp. But when you actually manage to find a good setup with trying out a lot of gear around it, then it will sound very awesome. So here are the settings I came up with over a long journey of setting it up. Funny enough, I found an interview with COB tag newbie, and he he shared the exact settings for Alexis GP1000. Again, keep in mind they were actually modded. Preamp volume on maximum, distortion on maximum, middle pretty much full, bass and treble on mid positions. Uh, Rope used a bit more low end, but sadly, they didn't share the mid shift or the push poles of those. I mean, the push poles of the bass and treble do not make that huge of the difference. The mid shift position does, but I believe that he got it on three, because usually you don't want to use any other of them. But other than sound, is it well built? Let me tell you, this thing is built like a tank. It got thick metal housing, very satisfying and quality knobs, pods and overall quality is still, after 30 years, fantastic.
I even go that far and say you probably won't find any preamble that well in the last 30 years. At least that easily. But from that quality point of view, what about the internals? There were a couple rumors and interviews with people playing and stating that they were likely to fail and to overheat. After years of using them, not only at home, but a lot live, I have kind of supported that claim, but not really. They're not the most reliable items on the market and not the most reliable items in my collection. To be fair, failures up until now were only minor, only some capacitors, resistors and tubes, no big failures like the trafo. But then again, there is not much going on in this huge housing anyway, so there is not a lot that actually can break. I was always glad that I got a spare one in my rack that I can use when the first one failed and to be honest, I was always glad to have spare ones at home between gigs. There were not much time repairing gear, so I just switched out the defective preamp and put in a working one so I can repair it at a later time. But keep in mind, it's a tube amp. It creates a lot of heat and it is not a solid state amp which are usually more reliable when it comes to that. Actually some of the tubes were burning out pretty fast and I still don't have a valid reason for that. Okay I use them live like a lot and, and two of the preamps that I bought actually still got the original tubes in there and when I used them a lot more than I think they were used, the tubes actually failed at some point but to be honest, after 30 years I wasn't even that mad. But this may be because the tubes are actually at the maximum of current and voltage. If I can rely on that schematics, that would explain this and since I use this thing live a lot, where there is a lot of heat, vibrations and traveling, it might be one reason. I don't think it would fail that often in a home environment though. What can I say often? Let's say one fails at about once a year. So it's fine. So I can confirm it partially, but they are not that bitchy and they fail not more than like, I don't know, like 1% of the time that you have gigs. So it's absolutely fine and probably any other preamp that is built like that would have the same problems when it comes to live environments and heat. To make use life off of that, I gotta tell you though, you need a couple other things too. If you happen to have a solo sound, like it a bit louder with effects, use a second preamp for that you will need it. This thing also has a clean channel and what a lucky coincidence, it has a foot switch you can use to switch from distorted to the clean sound. Forget it. You will need a third preamp for the cleans. Why? Does it sound like shit? No, the cleans off of that thingy are really good and then the EQ is actually working. But sadly, since you have to crank up every volume and gain from the distortion, your clean channel has absolutely no use, since it's in a complete overdrive and a lot louder than. So it's basically analog clips. Also funny enough, if you switch on clean and you can actually hear the EQ changes you did and boy, you have the feeling that doesn't come from the same amp since it's done way over the top.
So if you actually want to use this thing in a live situation, you need three preamps, one clean, one rhythm distortion, and one for your solos. Funny enough, that's what, for example, Zach Wilde did, because there is no other work around. Alex and Rope never had such problems, since they only used one sound and didn't boost their solos live off of the paddle boards, but rather the tags crank up the faders a bit. But if you want to, and have to switch it yourself, Yourself, I got bad news for you because you need a couple then. I wouldn't recommend using a clean GP1000 though. It's not that impressive and it's really good feature is the distortion sound and there are way better preamps out there that does a better clean sound. Let's now talk about something that kinda kills the fun. The pricing. The original MSRP of that preamp in 87 and 88 was 599. In today's money, that would mean around 1,500 bucks, which is already a crazy amount for just a preamp. But well, it's 1987, so that was fine, and people were buying it. I mean, since it was the first mass-produced preamp in a rack unit. Two years later, the first preamps with MIDI came to the market and basically no one wanted to use the GP1000 anymore because the new ones had 120 different sounds they could use. Also imagine that you could actually switch between distortion and clean and also up the volume with your MIDI switcher so you didn't need three preamps but just one. None sounded as good as the Lee Jackson but hey 120 sounds. So in the end and they stopped producing them by 1988. That's why the prices dropped heavily in the 90s and early 2000s for them. So you could get them for around 100 bucks, which would have been a seal back then. But let's talk about the prices today because we live today and we only care about the prices today and what you have to pay for that thing. Because the prices today are wild and I don't know what is going on inside people's heads. Right now, if you search for sold items, they sell between 300 and 1,500 on the market. Depends on which model, usually the 88 sell for more than the 87. But should you pay 1,500 for that preamp? No, absolutely not, since it's not worth the money. And after Alexi's death in 2020, the prices were rising like crazy again. <sighs> that is not how it should be. So what do I think is fair price? And I tell you everything between 350 and 500 is a fair price, even though 500 for it should be in a very good condition, fairly maintained, original and maybe new tubes. Everything above that is definitely nothing you should pay for it. But Dignity, you said it sounds so good and is unique. There are a lot of preamps out there that will sound great too. I know the GP1000s are rare, but they are not worth that much money. They will give you a hard time and you will hate them. They are not easy to use, like plug it in and go for a great sound. Everything below 300 would be a price you should always buy them. Above 500? I would not recommend it. Roast me for this, but I don't think they are worth that much money. They do too little for what you get. For that money, you could get equally good gear and even more. For example, if we stay with preamps about that price range, for about 400 to 600, you will get a Marshall JMP1, which is a very nice piece of gear. For the same price ranges, you'll get some nice angle preamps. Hell, you can even get really awesome rock trunk gear for that money too. I don't see why you should pay more than you would pay for equivalent gear that actually is more versatile than the Lee Jackson. It's not worth it paying double or triple the amount. And remember, you still need a power amp, which are not cheap either, and two power amps are quite costly. So keep that in mind. 
I just don't see more value here than it objectively provides. But other than a nostalgic rare piece of gear, but if you take this into account, it might be worth it for you to buy it at those rates. If you value this more than what you get for your money, but that is up to you. Let's draw a conclusion here. The Lee Jackson GP1000 is a very unique and weird sounding preamp that is way too picky about the gear in your signal chain. The pickup and boost distortion, tube screamer and front is crucial and it affects your sound a lot. It is not an all-rounder. It can just produce one sound and that's it. You cannot expect it to sound like something else or think that you can dial something things in to match with your gear. You have to take it at what it can do and accept what it cannot. You have to match the gear to the GP1000. If you don't, it will sound like a Line 6 Spider that you dropped from a 3 story building. You need to keep in mind that buying this amp means you have to go on a journey testing things in your signal chain to see what works and what not. Which means that for approximately 3 months you won't get any nice sound out of that preamp until you figured out gear that works. Which means that for that time you will hate that preamp and ask yourself why you paid so much money for such a crappy piece of gear. Until you really find something that works for you and the sound you desire. It won't be a high gain monster. It won't be sounding like new metal bands, more like 80s rock metal on steroids. But it sounds good and you probably never heard so many mids in your life. And I can tell you, it sounds way better in person than on recordings. <laughs> Its EQ is misleading and while it doesn't do that much, your midshift actually does a lot but only one of the settings really sound awesome and I bet nobody on this planet would choose any other setting other than 3 upwards. You don't have low end and you may add it with an exciter and one output is basically not usable because then you have even less low end. Other than that, you get a really overpriced preamp now that basically does less than any other amp you can buy for that money. And you probably need to even invest more money that it actually sounds good. It fails from time to time in hard conditions, but it's not a lot. But the thing is 30 years old. And to be honest, when you're over 30, you're gonna fail from time to time too. So you should mind either that this thing does. It is heavy as fuck because the housing is so massive so you will definitely get your rack from a medium weight rack to a heavy weight rack but at least it won't break if you drop it. The noise it produces if you got a lot of shit going on in your rack is abysmal and you should probably gate everything to death. Otherwise, this humming noise will even be louder as your tinnitus. So, what is it really that speaks for this preamp? The sound. It is just the sound you will love and in the end you will think it was worth it. It is not a sound you can achieve with any other gear that I know, that probably anybody knows. I strongly recommend before buying that kind of amp, you gotta be sure what you're buying and probably you need to hear and test it in real life. Even better at somebody's location who already got the sound, because then you can fully decide if you like it or not. And let me tell you, recordings on YouTube do not capture what those things actually sound like. They sound nice in recordings, I get that, but in person it is still different. Hope you like this kind of review. Do you own a GP1000? What is your opinion? Do you agree? Do you disagree? 
I'm really curious what gear you use to make it sound awesome. Write it down in the comments and let me know. And I hope I could help you in some sort of way to decide if you want to buy a GP1000 or not. Thank you for watching and I see you in a few days.